After that, the calls started pouring in from people who were desperate for someone to investigate. That was the fuel that started the film. Before we started filming, we had the opportunity to sit down with one of our favorite authors and documentarians, G. Edward Griffin, to find out what he knew about the subject. I'd like to talk uh, for a minute about an issue that's getting more and more attention. That's the issue which scientifically is called stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, also called the chemtrail issue. I'm very aware of the chemtrail versus contrail controversy. As far as I'm concerned, it's an open and shut case. I have been watching the development of uh, jet travel from its very beginning. I used to live near the Los Angeles airport. Remember when the first jets came in and landed? Man, they made a big noise. We never heard a noise like that before. And we used to go down and sit at the end of the runway and watch these jets come in and, and take off uh, because it was a novel experience. I've been watching jets all my life. And I, know about jet contrails. I've watched them. They, they're vaporized uh, moisture, ice crystals, and they get out there in the atmosphere and then they uh, effervesce and evaporate and then disappear. And you can see them. The plane moves along and the little white trail follows right behind it, and usually about 10 or 20 lengths of the plane or thereabouts, and then it's gone. And you can still see them that way, by the way, once in a while. So there goes a contrail. These other things we're talking about are not at all the same phenomena at all. These planes go by and they billow out this white smoke and it covers the sky from horizon to horizon. It doesn't dissipate at all. And they crisscross each other. And you see this thing cover the sky and turn it milky and then people start having trouble breathing and then you hear stories about the, the aluminum and barium deposits that they're picking up and the residue. And you put it all together and I don't see how anybody who's got their eyes open and their mind open can come to any other conclusion but that somebody is spending a lot of money and effort to spray the planet. The question is, why? I have my own theories, but I hope that there will be some good investigative reporters go out there and get us the answer. I know that whenever it's finally discovered, and it will be, the people who are doing it will undoubtedly say, Oh, well, we did it for you folks. It's for the greater good of the greater number. It's for the society. It's probably to prevent global warming. Or maybe it's to inoculate people against some kind of a dreaded biological attack. We can't go around shooting everybody in the arm, but we can spray them and save their lives. You see how good we are? We're doing it for the benefit of society. I know they're going to, whatever it is, they're going to say it was for your good but mine. Think if we had the ability to steer hurricanes, and the hurricane was going to slam into New Orleans. And let's say you could steer it so it would hit Mississippi instead, where for a hundred that means I would be willing to uh, more or less kill 18 Mississippians to say 1,800 New Orleanians. Uh, you know that uh, you know are and if you do that knowingly are you murdering those hundred people and there's all kinds of equity issues there now also we might be wrong about our steering and and if we didn't do the research right maybe our steering would intensify Katrina and even kill more people in in New Orleans and so this question of how do you develop the confidence to know that your in intervention will reduce overall damage and then how do you deal with the understanding that you might be damaging some people who wouldn't have been damaged before while saving people overall? The spraying appears to be mostly in NATO countries. I've seen it here in the United States, I've seen it in England, I've seen it in Scotland, uh, I've seen it in Canada, and I've had reports uh, from people who live in France. There's a grouping, there's a political grouping here of some sort. It's international in scope. It's not just an American phenomena, it's international, and um, anybody that wants to investigate that I think has to take that fact into consideration. They're going to find a political grouping and a political motive here, but in my humble opinion it's not in your good or mine at all. I don't know what it is, but we'll soon find out. I'm sure that uh, if you follow the old advice, which is follow the money, you'll come to the answer sooner or later. 
Soon, we realized that we all shared the same need to get this information out there, to share with the public, to let people know what is being done. Ed felt so passionately about the issue, he offered to help us. Well, the main thing now, since it looks like the budget is going to be met, uh, is to get it done well. We don't come off the tree knowing any answers at all. You know, we're not scientists. We're, not, we're just asking questions, exactly. And we, you know, we've got to be very skeptical about the answers. That's uh, it's totally accurate, totally honest. Why can't people see this? They're not hearing it. They don't know that the facts are not being presented. We're very lucky, you know that. Look at this opportunity that's been dumped on us. I <laughs> know. <laughs> opportunity. It's well, this is gonna. Yes. This is gonna be a battle. I know it's a that. Challenge and a battle, but I mean, why are we here if it's not for that? Take a little get hold tomorrow, so it's gonna be you for the moment. I'll call him again. So. Sounds good. <laughs> I saw the sky crisscross mm -hmm. with camp trails, and I don't, I can't remember if it was in L.A. or if I, I was on the road, but I had looked up one day, and I thought, look at that. That's not the flight path, man. That was a yeah. grid, a grid, a regular grid yeah. over the city, milky, and I couldn't milky, believe my eyes. Milky white clouds. And, you know, it all seems very obvious, and now the evidence of what we have on the ground with the aluminum, the barium, strontium, and with what we in the patents and what the geoengineers say are going to happen. I mean, for the everyday Joe, this is a slam dunk. This is a very delicate moment for the powers that be because they're taking a covered up operation like the tropospheric aerosol program or chemtrails, Project Akiras, whatever. It's had many names over the years. And they're making it over into a geoengineering scientific uh, shield to deflect sunlight because global warming's out of hand. So, at this very moment, the belly of the beast is right above us with no armor. Whether people believe in chemtrails or not, the geoengineering should be scary enough. And when people learn about geoengineering, chemtrails will then become apparent because they're the same. So you're talking about global conspiracy here. Geoengineers propose doing this on, on a global level. Off to Redding, California. I guess this is the second step after the 88 AF meeting. We'll see what we find. Right here in Northern California at Dana Wigginton's house, he owns over 2,000 acres overlooking Lake Shasta. He told me about some of the challenges that they're having up here. Let's go and talk to Dane. We'll see, you know, what's going on on his property. We'll see what he's going through and also what, what action he's taking based on the test results that he has. As you know, I have a background in the energy fields. I worked in the first solar plants in the continental U.S. in the early 80s. My home was on the cover of the world's largest renewable energy magazine. So this is my background. My goal has been to alert the public there is a mountain of toxic material falling on us, period. Before, about five years ago, our skies were typically blue, and now you see it's covered with lines and haze. And virtually nothing you see on the horizon, nothing you see in the sky above us, is a natural cloud. I mean, it is, it is virtually all the remnants of these aircraft lines that you see uh, fanning out, spreading into clouds, uh, artificial clouds, but the sky is a very dirty look to it. Uh, there's not the white cloud blue sky that we had only a few years ago, but it looks like there's some sort of massive industrial activity or forest fires burning over there, and we see that typically every night. You see even, even down to ground level, the clarity drops off significantly and um, we don't see that all, except for the days when we have these long lingering trails that uh, spread and cover the whole sky and on certain days you can see these trails actually dropping vertically like a veil. Uh, we assume the particulates are descending and, and we have the test to prove that uh, we are being inundated with uh, levels of aluminum and particulates that are literally tens of thousands of times what would already be considered high. So we're not talking about uh, exposure to uh, a, a slight percentage higher of, of these toxic materials. We're, we're talking about quantities, for example, off the side of Mount Shasta. If you can pan back 
That's a, that's a landmark in Northern California, considered to be a pristine water source. Uh, aluminum or snow sample off the side of Mount Shasta tested 61,000 parts per billion. This is just ordinary snow water. And people are drinking this stuff when they're hiking on the mountain. And remember, government action is required at a thousand. This is 61 times over the government limit, and our hikers are drinking this poisonous water on Mount Shasta Mountain oh itself. God. Barium, 83. Strontium, 383. So this summer, the people climbing are drinking poison. Uh, basically. I, I certainly wouldn't want to drink 61,000 micrograms per liter of aluminum. And again, we, we've already seen in five years soil pHs in this area that have escalated 10 to 12 times. And we can prove that conclusively. Well, this is not speculation. We can prove conclusively that these metals have been in the rain. We have duplicate samples. Bachelor of Science in Forestry, International School of Forestry at Missoula, Masters in Zoology, specialized in aquatics, 35 years with the U.S. Forest Service as a wildlife biologist, and before that, uh, several years with the USDA Soil Conservation Service as a soil conservationist. Also have run the botany programs, uh, range and grazing programs, and I continue that today. Right now I do a lot of master gardener consultation work. When I started this garden back in about 2005 or so, the pH here was 5.5, 5.6. This is the old soil survey of the county. Mm -hmm. You can look at the page right here. This is my soil right here. Mm -hmm. It's a Dietz 125, 126 here at my house. And here, the soil reaction pH should be between 4.5 and 6.0. And over there in the pure mud, it's even a little darker. It's 6.8 right there. And, and what can this do to plant life? in ecosystems? Well, you haul one of these things out and you start looking at the little little things that are crawling around the soil, a lot of times they aren't there anymore. The uh, little soil arthropods that you can barely see on a microscope, you can actually see movement with this, little tiny, tiny, tiny macroscopic, look like little moving pieces of dust. Those start to go away. They're not gone entirely, but they start to go away. This is black oak acorns. You know, this is this is pieces of cedar wood. You know, come on, folks. This should be very acid, and I'm getting ten times higher than expected. And there's something really wrong here. Well, you can see all those uh, reports. You, lots you of them. Have over 20 reports here. Uh, well, at least 20. I'd say it'd be closer to 30. All revealing dangerous amounts of aluminum and barium. You know, the science is there that something funny is happening, and the naysayers say, well, so what? Isn't neutral good? Well, no, neutral's not good. Neutral is not good. If your soil is supposed to be 5.6, it should stay 5.6 if you want the forest to be healthy. And if you want to grow a good garden, you have to keep your pH around 6.0, 6.5. I think that we just need to wake up and just look at what's happening because we can't just ignore it because it's going to get worse and worse if we just keep ignoring it and pushing it away like, oh, that's nothing. There was mason jars and they were brand new, sterilized, and that's what we catch the rain in. Mm -hmm. And then there was a HEPA filter that we tested the air with. Okay, so you caught rain and then you, you basically filtered air. Mm -hmm. What did you find? Aluminum. Here's another test that's revealing 375,000 yeah. parts per million aluminum, barium at 3,090, and strontium at 345. Yeah, that's from a lined pond. With EPDM fish safe pond liner, there is no chemicals, manufacturing materials at all in that pond liner that's uh, available to the aquatic life. It's designed for that purpose. The well that feeds this pond has been tested and retested. ND, no detectable aluminum, zero. The only other place this pond can receive water is rainfall. We are located on a filtered forested hilltop, miles and miles and miles away from any industry, highway, and so forth, 
after several heavy spray days, there was a film that we, we would see form on the surface of the water. And we tested that crust, and it was uh, 